Well, the best segment of the show, at least my favorite segment of the show, is back. The group text thread is, is here. Jeff and I, again, joined by Will Hill and Sam Penianovich. And uh, we kicked around a bunch of stuff last week and, and had some fun and uh, got off to, I think, a pretty good start with their season win totals. Uh, Buffalo couldn't quite get there for you, but, but they played well on the big LSU. Loss was uh, great on Sunday night. We don't want to kind of live in the past or anything, but I, this week typically is one of my favorite weeks of the college football season to bet because you get so many overreactions to what we saw in week one. So kind of what, how are you guys approaching week two? Like what have you learned from week one that you think is real? What have you learned from week one that you think might be a little, a, a little not real, a little fake, a little fugazi as some people might say? At, there's so many massively public sides this week, sides like Notre Dame, like Oregon, like like are, are these like auto fades for you guys, or 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 are you looking maybe to approach it a different thing? What do, what do you think, Sammy? <laughs> Could it be one of the most public sides maybe ever in college football? I was talking to Dave Mason who book uh, books bets offshore, and he's like, not only will this be the most bet college football game of all time. This will be the most public side of all time. And yet people are like, well, you can't bet against Colorado. The hell I can't. What are you talking about? This game was eight <laughs> on the look ahead. Nebraska was an eight point favorite. And now after winning the national championship in week one, Colorado is laying three <laughs> points. And I have to go back to the well and go against the Buffaloes. I have to. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I do. I, I, no, I, I, mean, I was just going to say, I, I agree with betting Nebraska. To me, it's just a matter of when, like, do you, do you just wait for a three and a half? And as soon as you three, three and a half, you jump on it because there was one slightly, you know, for up for a bit yesterday, or you just wait till right before kickoff thinking the ball's just going to keep rolling, keep rolling. And to me, it's just when you bet it. I, I agree. I, I think there will be a point at some point this year where these numbers might not catch up. Like it's going to come later in the year. I think when, Look, they're going to score on anybody. I mean, the offense is really good, but what happens when an offensive lineman gets hurt? When a defensive a linebacker goes like, they're, they're look, last week, as big as that win was, they should have given up 56 to TC. They had an interception in the end zone, and then the ridiculously great play by, by Hunter on the other interception. So they're going to score on anyone. But I, I'm, I'm curious, later in the year, once they start playing some, some whether USC, where they play Oregon and some of the other teams in the Pac-12, maybe they're, they're dinged up up front and they're not a deep team at all. That's going to be, I think, the time when you strike against Colorado. Are you, are you, are you, you buying on your uh, Pac-12 uh, conference mate there? I don't know if I'm buying on it, but I think their offense is for real. Uh, their offense line had issues, but Sean Lewis, the OC, did a great job of scheming up ways to get his guys into space. The question I have with Colorado is how long can Travis Hunter keep up this pace? 145 snaps in week one. I think they transitioned him more to defense, but against the bigger opponents, Nebraska, Oregon, USC, he probably will have to play both ways. But I'm buying Colorado being able to score points. But as Bear mentioned, defense issue, offensive line issue, how long can they keep this going? The hardest part for me between week one and week two is when I get a chance to watch these teams play is trying to figure out did they, you know did what they show in week one is that who they are was it a bad game was it the atmosphere and does that translate to week two because we know sometimes we're wrong about a team's profile right they just aren't as good as we think and, and is week one uh, indicative of a future season when they're not very good that that, that to me is the hardest part of, of week one some of the games you mentioned I think I'm having that issue trying to figure out is it football was it something else was it atmosphere are you going back home and playing better and now Colorado has opportunity again on a big stage against Nebraska who who offensively was atrocious. But again, is that just week one, sort of not, not knowing what they're going to be in offense, and now week two, they take that big jump? Well, I would expect to see Jeff Sims probably run the ball 25, 30 times to try and keep that Colorado offense off the field. Another team that I mentioned a little, Notre Dame, <laughs> like Navy is, but my takeaway from week zero was that Navy's terrible. And yeah, Notre Dame blew them out as they should have. Then you beat Tennessee State, an FCS team. Now you're laying north of a touchdown at Carter Finley against an NC State team that the defense isn't as good as it was last year, but it's the first real team Notre Dame's facing this year. I remember a couple of years ago, it, it, it was a sloppy game in the in pouring rain. And, and I, I, I look, Jeff, you you could probably tell me if I'm wrong. Coaches say all the time, like. The biggest improvement you're going to make from week in the season is from week one to week two. Like it was kind of an uninspired win that NC State had. Armstrong looked a little out of sorts against UConn. UConn kind of scrapped around and hung in there. Like it's NC State or nothing here, isn't it, Sammy? 
Well, we actually bet over 50, Bear. I think if Notre Dame is going to give up some some wiggle room, it's on the defensive side of the ball. We know their O-line is very good. I like Estime a lot. And look, Hartman's going to be able to throw the ball deep. They haven't had a deep threat in a long time in Notre Dame. So we bet over 50 and 50 and a half. You can now go 51. Obviously, that's a, a pretty big key number in football. But anything under 51 in the hook, I think, is good. I think this is a game that's maybe played in the high 20s, like a 28-27 game. I'm definitely with you, though. I'm not going to lay seven and a half with Notre Dame. We like over. Yeah, it'd be, I mean, the NC State or pass for me. I, I'd bet NC State plus seven and a half. So I, you know, look, it, it scares me a little bit. That's a funky three, three, five defense for NC State. And Hartman has seen that a few times being in the ACC. So that's one little subtlety of the game that does concern me. But to me, this is still a lot of points. That's a tough building to play. Uh, and I wasn't shocked they struggled with UConn. UConn's not that bad. That was sort of a an in the muck type of game that I was expecting against UConn. Close, low scoring. Uh, you're going to need to get some bigger plays if you're NC State. I think their biggest play last week was like 19 yards. So you're going to hit need to hit some explosives and, and be better in that department. But uh, I like NC state. I think they're right in this game. They're also off a bye, right? They played week zero and got last week off to reorganize themselves to play Notre Dame team. I think that really is going to help them offensively to figure out who they are. Uh, I'm not on this game at all. This, this one scares me. But Notre Dame's offensive line, as Sam mentioned, is really good. And that that gives me reason to believe they can score points in this game. They, they can grind a team out and be able to really physically take it to NC State in a way that NC State obviously hasn't seen yet just playing uh, UConn so far. TCU obviously won Big 12 massive loser uh, in week one as a north of a 20-point favorite. There was an even bigger one with Baylor <laughs> losing his close to a 30-point favorite at home against uh, a newcomer, uh, G.J. Kinney in, in, in Texas State. They're one on the road to Wigo and one. Blake, Blake Chapman is not going to play for Baylor, the quarterback, which is a big deal. And now you got Utah coming in. Who Look, you always have that. we always have that, like, water cooler discussion. Did, did Utah win the game or did Florida lose it? it was, look, I didn't think Utah looked that great against Florida. I think that was more bad Florida than it was great Utah. I'm still not sure if Rising is going to play or if he does, if he's going to be 100%. Now you're going to lay north of a touchdown on the road and kind of a, a, a circle of wagons, must win kind of. Dave Aranda is a very prideful guy, really good defensive guy. You would think ba it, it, Baylor will show up here and give Utah game. Yeah, Jeff, I know you're a, bi a big Pac-12 guy. But you get that same feel about the Utes and dangerous spot for them? I think you have to play the under of 47 here. I know the total was was this low of 45. I think it kicked off against Florida and easily went under. You mentioned Utah played well on defense which against a Florida team might not be hard to do. But Florida had a lot of mistakes, uh, uh, personnel issues, offside, you know, offside. They had a couple of good fourth down plays in that game, too, like the fourth and 14, run yeah. the little there's a little short slant, let the review try and break three tackles. <laughs> it, it, was, it, was not, it was not great. <laughs> but more importantly about why I don't think you take Utah in this situation, they're still going to be down about eight starters, right? Uh, Cam Rising, I do not expect to play in this game. And, and Bear mentioned, it, the Utah offense, guys, wasn't that great. They had a home run in the first play of the game, right, that no one expected them to do. And then Nate Johnson had that long touchdown run. That was about it. They scored one second half touchdown. That was off a, a turnover by Florida. And it's no surprise, right? They have a third string quarterback and then a four string quarterback and Johnson, who they really used up sort of all their plays. They, you know, they can run the same sort of uh, offense back, but he really can't throw the ball very well. So there's not much offense for Utah to be had here. I know Baylor is down their quarterback, but I would go under here. I go under 47 and be fine with it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of thinking the same way. I'm surprised you say that because you look at Baylor. I mean, there's 73 points scored in the game last week, but I, I'm with you where it would be under with, you know, two backup quarterbacks, most likely. Whittingham's a conservative coach to begin with, so I could see a scenario where they just dominate the game in the trenches, both sides of the ball. Baylor's not good on the offensive line, so, you know, Utah gets a lead, and then they just take the air out of the ball and play conservative. That's not a that's not a fun one, though. Again, when, when it's 42, what was it, 42, 31 last week, Texas State and Baylor, now you're going to go under 47. That would be the play but that's uh that's not a fun one to sweat out of us i think we have to talk about too bear like why laying seven and a half and eight is a bad habit there's a couple of reasons why this look ahead number was utah four four and a half right. baylor looks awful line goes up but then earlier this week this thing was sitting seven and a lot of people will text me on saturday morning and go hey who do you like and i'm like well i made all my bets on monday and tuesday and wednesday because like <laughs> I, I got better numbers if you're constantly laying seven and a half and eight when the line was six on the open and then seven for the majority no, of the week, no. that is a bad habit, and we have to break those habits. Yep. Well, bad habits, 
Miami and Texas A&M have had a, ba- a bad habit of losing or playing down to the level of competition lately. And, look, I don't know if either of these teams are going to threaten for their conference titles or threaten to get to the conference championship game. But the one thing Miami and Texas A&M did last week was blow out an inferior opponent. We haven't seen that from Miami in a long time. A&M was lethargic last year doing it as well. This is a game, I, I am a Miami alum, I want no part of this game. I have to see it to believe it with Miami. I actually think A&M might be pretty good this year. I mean, Evan Stewart is, is an absolute dude. It looks like Miami has taken some money this week. I think this number is down to four, four and a half uh, in, in a lot of players, in, in a lot of places. That I, I just can't get all the way there yet with Miami, but at the same time, I do see, look, as bad as they were last year, they went on the road to College Station with a lot of offensive issues and and were in that game till the fourth quarter. So this game is a pass for me. Anybody have any thoughts on Miami, Miami A&M side or total? Nah, pass for me. I thought about the dog, but no bets. I might end up betting Miami here. I thought that, like you said, I thought they should have won last year in A&M and 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 they're better this year. Miami is. And uh, I like the matchup. Lance Gidry, the defensive coordinator for Miami was one of the better defensive coordinators in the country against an offensive line for A&M, which I'm not sure how good, uh, you know, how good they are. Uh, Look, I'll take the four points. I think Miami's got a really good shot to win this game. I just don't know what AM has done to deserve to be a favorite in this game, right? Um, I've been high on, on Miami all offseason. I, I know Mario Cristobal. He was at Oregon, so maybe there's some bias here, but I saw him build the Oregon program in the second season with a big roster turnover into a Rose Bowl champion, and he did the same thing in Miami. He, he redid that roster. He hired new coaches, and they're a much more talented football team. We saw that talent on display in their week one game, and he's always been up for these games. You know, Oregon played well in these big non-conference games. They didn't play so well against the Middle Tennessee State right at times, but they played well when AM is coming to town or when they're going to Ohio State. And so I think Mark Crystal will, will have his team ready, and I'd be very happy taking Miami plus four. It's not my favorite of the weekend, but I don't know what AM has done to deserve to be a favorite in this game. I, I think the one well, taking notes that here. I had. Taking notes. Jeff might have a Miami bias because of Cousin. Taking notes. There. I thought Van Dyke looked good. I don't know how much you guys watched Miami versus Miami of Ohio. I mean, I, I'm sure most people didn't, but I thought Van Dyke looked really good. Remember two years ago, he looked really good. Last year was awful. Uh, I was encouraged by what I saw last week. Yes. Yeah, the, the, coordinator, the coordinator change, I think, will do him wonders. And yes. the one thing that I did take away from that, from that game was their offensive line actually looked physical for the first time in a long time. And and Mario being a prideful South Florida, former Miami offensive lineman, you knew that would be the one area that he would improve dramatically. And and I think he did uh, last week. So I'll be curious to see against a really good defensive front uh, if that can continue. And it wasn't just a byproduct of playing a Mac team. I'd feel remiss if I didn't just bring up uh, the biggest game of the week, Alabama, Texas. Numbers right at seven. So it kind of feels like they're letting – uh, they're saying you decide what way you want to go and we'll move it to six and a half or we'll move it to seven and a half, depending on what, 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 what you guys think. I think Texas has a really good chance to win this game out, right? Like, like I don't think this is a great Alabama defense. I, I think they're good, but it does. I don't think they're like vintage Nick Saban type defense. I obviously Milrow is going to run circles around middle Tennessee state, but, but against Texas, that front seven of Texas is really really good so i think they're going to give alabama problems i I think texas is a dog is very very uh, attractive i think the under here is very attractive as well because i think texas's defense will do a good job against bama and and i'm not sure quinn ewers is all the way there yet i thought we'd hear a lot of talk this week about how uh, texas should have won last year dirty hit uh ewers got knocked out uh, bama lucky to win uh, I, I thought uh, bama was going to get a ton of bama is going to get revenge this year here and i haven't heard a ton of that like so look texas's offense didn't start great against rice but they kind of worked themselves into the game and, and, and bama was bama against an overmatched opponent but but texas is kind of attractive here i think I would say Bama, the one thing I noticed last week and, and just, you know, going over the roster, they do not have the embarrassment of riches that they usually have at, you know, receiver running back mm-hmm. where they're just two, three deep with pro right. after pro, which plays into your point about the under, you know, young quarterback to save and trust him right away in a big game. Maybe both teams come out a little tight here. There's a little, a little bit of, you know what, be conservative early on. So 
uh, to me, it would be under. And, and, you know, if it's a lower scoring game, obviously the points look attractive. And, and like you mentioned, if you like Texas, find the seven and a half. If you like Bama, find the seven or, you know, I don't know if there's six and a half still out there, but that's, that's bouncing around a key number. So make sure you get the good one. Yeah, totally nailed it about the number. You got to lay seven and you got to take seven and a half because both numbers are available. I actually texted you, Barrett, offline yesterday. I was like, what are we doing? Bama, Texas. And you said Texas. And I'm like, <laughs> damn it. We are heads up here. One of my favorite spots over the years is the, is the take that Bama team that's sort of laying in the weeds and nobody wants to mm -hmm. bet them. Like, in what world are we not excited to lay seven with Alabama against a former assistant? And here's the crazy part, too. Last year, I know they had Bryce Young and Jameer Gibbs and Will Anderson. Those are three top 10 picks or top 15 picks. That number, though, was 20. And now it's seven. This feels like it's way too low here, Jeff. I think they're telling you Alabama's not as talented as they've been in the past. And Texas, as Bear mentioned, you might dislike Sark's play calling and like the way he, he uses quarterbacks, but he has done a great job of building up the offensive defensive lines and kind of building up the back of that defense as well. Like this is a much more talented Texas team than we've had in many years. And they can go into Alabama and probably physically withstand the Alabama team, which again is not as good as they've been in the past. They have a sort of a talent drain over the years. It makes a, a bunch of sense with Georgia's success, LSU success, and NIL and transfer portal, all those things that have kind of hurt Alabama and their roster, but good. Still, still a great football team. Still one of the best in college football, but I think Texas talent wise can go into Alabama and give them a game. I have no play on this game, but I understand why the odds makers have made it seven points. Yeah. This is one of those games where like, this is one of those like pool sheet games where you're in a pool and it's going to be on there. What way you're leaning? You got to pick one or the other. Texas would be the way I, I would lean, but it's certainly not one of the, the, the better opinions I have of the week. Will Sammy, let's get, uh, your thoughts on what what we miss? What's your uh, what's your best thought of the week? What, what's the uh, what what game didn't we hit that you guys feel strongly about? I want to give you guys a chance to. Uh, I, I don't want, I don't want to be dealer choice here. I want to let you guys uh, give your opinion. I'll go first here. This is just a general thought, and I'll, I'll turn it into more of a question because Bear, you're, you've been betting these games for a long time. I'm not calling you old, but I guess I'm not not calling you old. I am old. What is with I'm this new 50, trend? I'm old. Now? Okay, tell like correct me if I'm wrong. Is this not a new trend here where these teams are up by 20, 30 points and instead, you know, four or five minutes left, instead of taking knees or just running up the middle and punting, they're going fast paced. They're punching in the end zone. Penn State, uh, who else was it? Central Florida. Is this uh, not no, a new no, thing? No one, no one loves the betting. late backdoor cover than James Franklin. He, James oh, Franklin man. is the master at that. He will do it every chance he gets. But you're right. Even in the Florida State LSU game, I mean, you know, Norvell had an opportunity to just kind of take a knee there and just run the, run the clock. I, that was, I think now in the college football playoff era, like teams are looking for a big margin of victory to kind of have an eye-popping score. And I think it might also be a little bit of a byproduct of the new clock rules where you don't get as many plays earlier in the game and maybe you have incentives contractually to score a bunch of points and, and you don't want your you don't want your point totals looking low for some reason. So you're actually going to use some of those plays later in the game uh, to maybe mask the shortcomings earlier in the game where you didn't have as many plays. So that's just a quick knee jerk off the top of my head thought as to what you might be seeing. Is it that, or is it make your boosters happy? Because it's, it's usually right around the number. It's like these coaches <laughs> seem to know the number. I don't know. No. It, it's make your boosters happy. They're paying these kids the NIL money because you want to spread the uh, wealth around your roster, right? So, so, so at the end of games, you've opportunities to get someone an extra touchdown, to get someone some extra touches, to put in a backup quarterback and let them run the offense. To me, it's about appeasing your roster and not just backing down the end of a game. If you can get a backup running back four, five, six touches, you can get some backup offensive linemen in the game. You could throw the ball, as, as Bear mentioned, to Florida State's tight end, who had done a great job blocking all game. I, th I think it was number six. Get him on a little. Oh on the little screen and go play, right? Like you, you, you can give these guys opportunities to make them happy to, 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 to feel that they're fulfilled in, in their obligations as a student athlete, right? Like to me that it's about that more than it is about the spread or, or trying to run the score, but just making sure that everyone has an opportunity to touch the football. I didn't hear anything anybody just said. I heard James Franklin and I had PTSD when I had <laughs> Illinois plus a couple years ago. Illinois was up by four, and then Penn State scored 42 unanswered to cover. I will never, ever forget that as long as I live. I'll go quick here. We were digging through the garbage at Ohio this week. It sounds like Curtis work is good to go, and what was reported against San Diego State is not true. They were saying it was a knee injury. It was not. We're being told concussion. He got his bell rung against San Diego State, had to miss the game against Long Island. By all accounts, 
Curtis Rourke is going to play for Ohio, and we like the over. You can find 61 and a half between Ohio and Florida Atlantic. We think fireworks, Bear. Yeah, could, could Rourke back at quarterback against the Tom Herman offense. I, I would kind of uh, agree with you there. Uh, gentlemen, thank you. Let's have a great weekend, and we'll do it again next week. Bear Bets full episodes drop twice a week right here on the Bear Bets YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe to stay ahead of the odds, and let's celebrate all of our wins together.